Hey, Grant, you know, so I just want to thank you so much for coming on. Uh, you know, you've been a big inspiration. You were an inspiration to me. Uh, you know, at one point we were kind of like uh, a little bit of, I don't know if you want to call it rivals, you know, with going on to the 2004 Olympics and stuff like that. Uh, but at the same, on the same hand, you, you were a great inspiration and uh, someone that I did actually look up to and continue to look up to. And so I just, I really want to thank you. And I appreciate that you're, you're joining us for the Myers Mile. And uh, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to let you just introduce yourself and maybe talk a little bit about your bio and we'll go from there. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for putting this together and having me on. Uh, I was reading about it last week or a couple of days ago, actually, and I uh, feel honored to be on the, uh, the list of interviewees. Uh, there's some pretty, pretty cool, pretty cool uh, interviews and people on here, so I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Grant Robison. Uh, I grew up in Oregon um, in, in pre, Preville. Uh, where all we ever heard about was three prong this and that. Um, so I grew up in a little town just south of Portland um, and went to McMinnville High School. Uh, ended up going to have the opportunity, very fortunate to get in and go to Stanford University um, and run, run with some incredible teammates. Uh, I was very much the kind of person that wanted to be the little fish in the big pond and I got my wish there. Um, they really, I mean, my teammates in that environment really, I think, extracted the best out of me that I, that I possibly could have, could have uh, achieved. And uh, so I feel very fortunate about that. Um, I ran post-collegially for a few years, uh, kind of near the end of my college career and into professional running. I was just turned into a battle of injuries from one to the next. So I graduated in 2004 from Stanford and ran pieced together another four, four or five years after that, and then kind of hung it up after probably 2009 or so. Um, and yeah, um, mile was my favorite event. Uh, coach used to make me run the 5K and that hurt a lot. And I tried to avoid that whenever I could, but take it for the team sometimes and run it at conference and um, run it when I had to. I think secretly I knew that was probably my better event and probably where my strengths should have been, but I just liked running the mile more, so I tried to tried to stick to that. Um, I guess the PR breakdown, I, my 800 was 147. I didn't run many 800s, and I ran one just to get a fast time, and that was good. I was happy with it. Uh, I ran 335 in the 1500, um, and then 1340 in the 5K. Um, in high school in Oregon, we ran the 1500 and the 3000. So I know a lot of the country kind of do conversions on that, but um, my high school PR was 356 in the 1500, which is like a 411, 410, 411, I think. And then the, my 3K PR was an 832, which I, I think was right around 910 or so for a converted 3200. So, wow, that's yeah. Great. I mean, that's. Uh pretty impressive <clears throat> PRs there. Um, <clears throat> really, yeah, you're right. I am impressed with that 5k. That's, uh, some, some fast running. Um, so what were, as far as like major, you know, what's the highest level that you achieved? You know, what did you get to? Yeah, I guess I should have included that in my bio. Um, I did get the chance to run at the Olympics, uh, like you alluded to in 2004. Um, it's kind of a strange, as you know, a little bit of a strange sequence of events with the qualification and making that team. And I'm grateful for it. I was, I was injured going into it. Um, so it's kind of a mixed memory, mixed emotionally, um, how that kind of all worked out and how I was able to perform at the Olympics. It wasn't great. And, uh, I always wished I had another shot at it or things had gone differently, but I think everybody, every runner that's ever run is said something similar about their their careers um uh i had the, I, I won the ncaa outdoor 1500 one year um that was a kind of a highlight i, I got to be on a great um cross country sequence of cross country teams through those years in college so we we won the ncaa team title in cross country which 
are probably the highlights of my running career. Being part of that and being on those teams was is what when I think back on running, those are like the happy highlights of like, wow, that was so fun. Um, back in high school, I won. I, did, I was fortunate enough to win some state titles. I won the 1500 a couple of years and the 3K. I won three years. Um, so I had some, some good races in high school. I never made the Foot Locker. We didn't have Nike Nationals, Nike Cross Nationals back when I was in high school. So Foot Locker was like the thing. And I never made the finals. I never got to go to San Diego for it. Uh, that's always been a, a sticking point as well in my memory. I've never quite put it together on the right day to make the cross country finals. But um, so yeah, I think I think winning some that individual title in in track was a big stepping stone in terms of just my confidence and and kind of going forward and setting up for a good year leading into 2004. I won I won the the track title in 2003 so it was kind of kind of the boost and the kick into the following summer and into 2004 um, but the Olympics was is every runner's dream and I, I'm very fortunate that I got to to experience that and, and go be part of that yeah I mean and <clears throat> you know that's a listening to your accomplishments as far as you know, where you've been or what you've done. That's, that's very impressive. I mean, like you said, obviously the Olympics is a dream of anyone that's going pro for sure. <clears throat> you know, Olympics, world teams, stuff like that. Um, but you touched on something and you said that one of your fondest memories was being a part of, you know, some team titles. And that's something I want to talk about a little bit later is, you know, the culture at Stanford and what that meant to you and how that changed your career. So, I'm glad you touched on that. Um, but before we circle back to that, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about your general training. Like what was that like, you know, high school and then maybe how that was changed uh, through college? Yeah. Back in high school, I didn't really, I guess I was too young to appreciate it. Um, my coach always told me that his main goal was to set me up for the next level, uh, which I've been a, excuse me, eternally grateful for. Um, I think that really did set up my career. Um, I didn't train super hard in high school. Uh, I think you did a great job of balancing, I think, the potential and my talents um, with not overloading me and really never really maxing out my training. I think he'd dip into some of it and, and got a lot out of me. But um, in high school, I was very low mileage, maybe 30 miles a week. Um, I did a lot of runs where we'd end up at a swimming pool and cut our run short and just swim for the rest of practice and then walk back to the track. So it was very, um, pretty, I don't know about laid back, but we enjoyed it. Uh, I think, I think my coach knew we were in high school and we needed to enjoy that and there'd be lots of time for running hard later. Um, so I, I ran very low mileage kind of, we do some intense track work and I think that that really transferred over into college as well. I, I think it didn't take long for my coach at Stanford, Coach Lenana, to figure out where where my limits were as well in volume. Um, my mileage PR, I think, is still 78 miles in a week, and that was freshman year cross country camp, and I got kind of banged up after that. And I think we figured out real quick that I just didn't have the body. I, maybe I was too young, and maybe I would have worked into it, but I didn't have the the body to withstand the high volume so I was pretty low mileage high intensity we'd uh do track workouts probably three sometimes four times a week with a long run my long run would max out at about 12 miles a couple times in my career I ran a 15 mile long run but that was about it um low mileage high intensity was kind of my my mantra and what we found worked yeah that's a uh... That's 100% the same with me. Low mileage, high intensity, uh, work, work best for me. And it sounds like <clears throat> you were fortunate enough that you had two coaches who understood the individual side of things versus everybody does the same, you survive or, you, or, you're, or you're gone, you know what I mean? And, and I think that's really important is, you know, hey, so-and-so may be able to handle 60 miles a week and that's how they get the most out of their body while Grant can handle 
45 to 50, touching 60, and then coming right back. And that's how he gets the most out of his body. You know what I mean? And that's so, so important. Um, and a lot of – unfortunately, I think a lot of coaches, they're not willing to do that. They just throw everybody into this zone and say, hey, here you are, man. You don't want it or you're not. So uh, it's really, that's really cool to hear you say that. Um, so let's, let's do circle back to the team culture thing uh, and how important that was in your life and in running career and, and just overall just how important is was the culture at Stanford and and how did it shape things for you yeah I mean I think that it's what attracted me initially um I think I mean obviously a visit to Stanford will win just about anybody over but um when I took my college visit there I think what struck me when I, when I visited, there's the Hauser twins and Nathan Nutter, and they were kind of the, the leaders there um, during that time. And, and I think it was, it was tangible. Like I recognized it even as a high school kid taking my visit there. Of like, these guys are like serious. Like, they're here to, to take care of business. And um, just going down to practice on my visit and seeing like some of the team flying back from, a, from doing a relay, uh, can't remember where or why but it just seemed very like it wasn't messing around uh, it was, there's a there's an environment and a culture of, of like we want to we want to do good at this thing and uh, there's the leaders there that that kind of led that um, <clears throat> so when I got there and, and had started being part of it um, I think it just there was a couple individuals and athletes over the years that struggled mixing into that and kind of it was just kind of a weird a, a difficult uh shift I guess for them but for the most part I mean Jonathan and Gabe and all of us like we just we were there to like work together and just get the most out of each other and, and it wasn't always perfect but I think that that environment really kind of set the stage for getting the most out of us um we were there, we were competitive with each other, but we all were also friends and teammates. Um, and it, it was just constant, like, it wasn't like a pep talk, but it was just like an unspoken pep talk of like, we're, we're here, you don't miss practice, you're not late to practice, like you, we're here and we're all gonna do this together. Were there any like, um, <clears throat> I don't know, like, you know, did you have anything up on the wall, like locker room or, you know, was there something that just, stated it at all like hey this is what we do or was it just the group of guys and with the leadership of the coach and it was you know just more of that style of culture yeah we never had like a board or anything that you touched on your way out of the locker room or anything like really? that like, it wasn't so stated as that right before i got there was when they kind of formulated the idea of the machine um, yeah, oh yeah kind of became like the stanford thing so aside from like the t-shirts and just kind of the spoken, like we're a machine, like no part is, is unnecessary. Like we all got to work together on this. It's more just that, more just the vibe, just the conversations uh, and just the attitude when we're, when we're at practice that kind of just set that tone. And I love that whole machine thing. I mean, <clears throat> and I don't know if a lot of our viewers are going to know that without looking it up. I think there might be some interviews on flow track or some things on flow track about the machine. Um, and I don't even know if it was necessarily your guys's group, but I, you got were your, your group was kind of the start of that. Yeah. Well, I think the Housers, <clears throat> so started, but the Housers and Nathan, I think okay. kind of picked that off. Um, and again, this is way old. You guys will have to like any high school kid will have to Google super ancient history to uh learn about nathan nutter and the housers but um but yeah i think those guys they had started it just the year two they must have started in 96 97 90 yeah 96 97 i think would have been the machine formed and it kind of it picked up steam obviously with with jonathan and gabe and stimber and that the crew that kind of came in while i was coming up um it kind of just solidified and, and really became like the Stanford thing so well I gotta I gotta say I experienced the machine um and <laughs> it was intimidating uh you guys and I don't I don't remember if you were 
a part of it at the time or not, but I was at a cross country meet. It might've been like a regional meet. I, I don't remember where it was. It was a big meet and the Stanford team rolled by on the warm up, and it was very much a machine. I mean, it was like the entire group, you got, I think everyone was running their warm up pace was just so incredibly fast that we were like, well, are they racing or are they warming up? You know what I mean? And it was, the message was there. You know, it was, it was like, <clears throat> we're here, we're here for business. And if you're not get out of the way. And it was, it was kind of, I'll be honest. I mean, it was cool. And I, and I think back about it and I even try to use sometimes that mentality with my own athletes. It's like, Hey, we're the machine, you know, we're, we're here doing it. And whoever's not, isn't you know what i mean and not to say we don't have fun but sometimes fun is being that machine right how fun was that good to do well it's fun to yeah. do well <laughs> yeah it is, it is a lot of fun to do well and, and to be a part of something like that so that's that's really cool and it's cool to hear you talk about that um and you guys had such a crazy wild fun group um, i know all those guys that you're talking about a lot of those guys and um and can we just i don't want to change I don't want to get off topic too much, but can we real, really quick talk about Jennings? Just did did are the rumors true of how often drums were being played at at, at, <laughs> at tracks and stuff? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we are. Um, so I took like so after my freshman year, I did a two year mission, and so I left. To, I was living in South Africa for two years on a church mission. That's really um, cool. And that was when Gabe came into his own. I guess Gabe was always Gabe, but uh, he kind of, uh, he, he blossomed while I was gone. So I remember hearing about it and seeing like, seeing the drums come out and, and hearing, getting messages and people from the team like telling me about it. So by the time I came back, the drumming was in full full effect and drumming, drums were getting outlawed at certain tracks and it was, it was like a full, a full thing. Um, but yeah, it's true. And Gabe was just, he was so high energy. Um, and he just was always doing crazy stuff. I remember on a bus ride to the airport one time to go to a meet, he was reading a book upside down and backwards. And he was just talking about how he was getting so much more out of the words when he had to stop and figure out each word as he went. And it was just like, he looked, he, he certainly had a different view on the world than, than what most of us he was looking through different colored lenses, clearly. Um, but man, talk about energy and just like always good for a laugh, even when he wasn't wasn't trying to be funny and just a great teammate and, and always just made you want to like run better and compete with him. Yeah, I will say he was definitely another guy that was very inspirational. I mean, and, and like you said, it was a different kind of inspiration, but it was it was definitely there. And I, I was at a meet or two where I heard the drums, you know, and <laughs> and I, I got to say, it was kind of intimidating, but on the same hand, it was kind of inspirational. You know what I mean? Like, I also fed into that energy and was like, hey, all right, here we go. You know, the drums are out. So it's, it it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of a neat, neat thing. So kind of something really cool to be a part of. Um, I remember one year at the Cardinal Invite when it had become, it's become a professional meet and the Kenyans were there and the Japanese team came over and it was like, it was a really cool night meet and the drums just kind of took off uh we had the drums there but then people like not even stanford people started turning over like garbage cans and stuff so there's just like drums all the way around the track and um that was one night i think i mean i forget what the 10k went but it was like it was in the 26 26s and there was just that atmosphere was really cool and that was oh. i mean it it gained a life beyond gay but you gotta give credit where credit's due. That was all Gabe. Oh yeah, no, it's it 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 would it'd be sweet to be you know around the track that that's going on. So um, let's change gears just a little bit and let's go to race strategy. Um, you mentioned that you love the mile, and the mile is obviously your favorite race. Whether it was your best or not, we're not sure. But um, <clears throat> this is about the mile, and we've it's, we've we've tried to figure out hey you know, what are some of the better strategies or what are people's different strategies out there? What was your strategy? You know, did you like to get to the front or did you, you sit and kick or let's hear it from you. Yeah. I figured out pretty early on training with the guys that I trained with on the team that I was, 
I just didn't have the sit and kick. I know that's very much a Myler mentality and everybody wants to wait to the last 150 and then just go for it. But I remember, I distinctly remember running a workout one time and I was behind Stimber and Jason Lund. And I remember watching their legs and we we're doing kind of like change of pace stuff. I think maybe around the 600s or whatever, where you had to maybe have a little bit slower, like a route a steady 200 then you'd accelerate into a 200 and, and just kind of change your pace mid mid interval and I remember being behind those guys and seeing them accelerate and I remember distinctly looking at their hamstrings and re and like recognizing that I didn't have those and just being like wow I guess I, I'm missing whatever those guys are, are have like attached in the back of their leg because um, they could accelerate so quickly and I could slowly move up to that speed but it'd take me 20 30 meters to do what they could do in five meters so i knew like i didn't have the wheels to be a good sit and kicker um i didn't mind going to the front and controlling um i was i kind of grew into that it takes a lot of confidence and i didn't always have that confidence to be to sit and, and control the pace i think my best my favorite race strategy um I kind of learned not comparing myself to LG, but watching Garouj run, I think he knew where his strength was as well and that he really needed to string people out. Because there were other guys coming up from the 800 or whatever that could ultimately outwheel him if it came down to it. But he knew he could, he knew he had the strength to out, out muscle him if he started far enough out. So I kind of adopted his strategy of going at like 500 out and just really winding it up. So that by the time you got to 200 to go, you were at basically top speed and everyone was hanging on for dear life, including yourself, but you just hoped your dear life had a little more than theirs. So I, I liked that. It hurt a lot running that way. Makes for a long last 500 when you're like, mm -hmm. when you're going for it. Um, but it, it definitely played to my strength of just, I had a good engine, didn't necessarily have the fastest wheels, but I knew I could, I could stretch it out that way. Yeah, and, you know, if you can be hanging on for dear life equally uh, the same as everyone else around you, yet you've got three to four steps on them because you're the one that set that up, uh, you know, then you do have you do have a good chance of holding them off, you know. it's. But I think the, the key to that, like you're saying, is you got to make sure it's hard enough. If you're going to do that strategy, you got to make sure that it's hard enough that they are hanging on for dear life or, or then you might get zipped in the end. Uh, but, yeah. That's that's you pretty cool. Willing to hurt because it does hurt. Like it's a very painful way to finish a race. So you have yeah. to be willing to go there, go to a dark place on the back stretch. Of, of yeah. This hurts a lot. Yeah, and and then you touched on confidence too. I, not just confidence leading from the front, but also the confidence of going there from 500 out. Like that takes confidence. Like okay, I'm already in pain. This race is already fast, but I believe in myself enough that if I just go, I'll be able to keep going right and that's huge so um if you had a uh if we look back at your high school days i want to know is there one specific you know memory that sticks out to you about high school days running you know is there like one memory that's just that that defines high school you know or something like that you know it's just vivid and you'll never forget it yeah, I don't know that there is one specific memory like that. I had one race. Um, the last race of my high school career was the state 1500 my senior year. And uh, my allergies were really bad. Um, and I remember just not feeling great. Just kind of being like, I don't know, just not with it, not in the race. Um, I remember I, that the MMA fight that just happened with Cowboy and uh, Connor where the and cowboy has since said that he like sitting in the locker room before the fight, like he just didn't really want to be there. And that was very much like how I've had those races over the course of my career as well. But I remember that being one my senior year of just being like, dude, I don't want to do this. Um, but it was my last race, my last 1500, uh, my last race of high school. And I was, I didn't really pull it together. I didn't want to be there until like the last lap again. And I was pretty far back and I was able to run everybody down and, and get in there. And I was pretty hurt afterwards and my allergies were so bad and I was throwing up and, and all that. But like mentally, it was a 
it was a key kind of memory for the rest of my life. Clearly, I, I remember it still um, of being like, you just don't quit. Like, I, I can't quit. I can't quit on myself. Uh, I have to like, I, I got to finish what I started. Like, if, if I'm there, I'm going to show up and I'm, I got to do what I came to do. Um, and it kind of just became, it didn't always work out that way. And I didn't always run my best, but it was always there as a lesson I learned right then and there. Like, you can't always run when you're feeling great. Like, sometimes you got to just, just do your best. And uh, it seems really simplistic, but it was a lesson that I, that I kind of learned on that day. I am so happy you touched on that because I, I, I think – I almost I would have to say 100% of athletes out there are going to go into probably a race where they felt crazy crazy confident from training and stuff but then the day of their nerves are through the roof and like you say I, I don't want to be here what am I doing here why am I doing this like this is going to hurt this is going to be hard what if I get beat you know all these all these crazy thoughts and questions flood their body and their mind and and emotion and and then, you know, the nerves, that jittery, nervous, like you almost want to crawl out of your skin type feeling, right? And so to know that, hey, and, and we talk with our, our own athletes about this all the time, to know like, hey, that's normal. It's part of the process. You just got to, like you said, just kind of got to toe the line. Like, accept it for what it is. Get out there. Don't quit on yourself. Toe the line and let your let yourself kind of get back into who you really are when the when the gun goes off you know take that big deep breath and go and next thing you're, you're going to realize hey the nerves are gone <laughs> you know it's no harder than i thought it was going to be sometimes it's not even as hard as a workout you know what i mean and then the next thing you know you, you can roll out and you can have such a great race you got the best race of your life but you have to toe that line and that's so many people just they don't get to the line you know, the nerves get the best of them and they're completely, completely shut down. They may toe the line, but they're, they're, they're done. You know what I mean? And, and it's, it's great that you learned that lesson because if you didn't learn that lesson that, Hey, if I just toe the line and I don't give up on myself, you may not have made it as far as you actually did in, in the future. So. Yeah. Oh, no way. I mean, there's just so many different, <clears throat> there's so many different lead ups to every race and, it was like we talked about before we even came on the recording of just like this my coach always told us coach Lanana always told us you're only as good as your last race and that's really true in track like single races really make or break a lot of a lot of seasons um i guess they don't necessarily break them but if you don't run well at at the one qualifying meet that you set up to run well at you know, things can change so the sport's very opportunistic and you have to be able to uh, perform on a day when, when you're just not feeling it. You're just not feeling great. Um, I remember going over to Europe. You go over there to run fast, but Europe's a different place. People are up having dinner at 2 a.m. and making tons of noise in the streets and you're having trouble sleeping and you're thinking like, oh, I'm not getting my eight hours of sleep that I need before my race day. And, you know, there's just every race every lead up has such so many different variables and factors that you have to be able to conquer that mental that mental step or at least work on it maybe you don't ever conquer it but you have to be aware of it and, and be working towards it yeah i 100 percent agree um you know you gave me a piece of advice uh i, I don't remember the exact year but you gave me a piece of advice uh i was pr pretty down on my luck probably the most down on my luck I've ever been. And you and I were invited to the Hershey um, meet. It was like a promotional type run. We weren't even really, really racing. We're kind of just setting up a, a race for the, the, the kids, the fans. Um, and I was, like I said, I was down on my luck. And we were fortunate enough that by being invited there, they let us, you know, go to the theme park and, so we were on a roller coaster ride and you looked at me and you obviously could tell I was down on my luck. I hadn't told anyone, but you, it was, I think it was obvious. <clears throat> you looked at me and you said, you know, Rob, running and life is a lot like this roller coaster. You know, you, you gotta, you gotta hang on, you know, for the downs, you gotta enjoy the ups and you just gotta have fun. And to this day, I use that advice. Uh, with my high school athletes 
you know, and, and I, that advice, whether you know it or not, actually helped me quite a bit. You know, it changed my outlook on things. Um, you know, I didn't, I, it's not like I flipped the switch, but it's something that I went back to a lot and I thought about a lot and I kept saying, you know, he's right. He's right. You know, you got to just hang on when it's tough and you got to enjoy it when it's great and enjoy it. Just have fun overall. Um, totally. Yeah. I remember that. That was a fun, that was a fun event. I know we both had some things in our personal lives that were going rough back then. And it was kind of a weird, I don't think either of us were really in very good shape. We were trying to break four. It was like a big thing to like set up, try to somebody run under four minutes. Yeah. I remember Jonathan yeah. and Riles was like not in a great shape. He wasn't in a great place either. It was talk about a ragtag crew at that point. But um, yeah, I do remember we got to run on a four by one with Carl Lewis. And that was pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah yeah but, uh, but yeah I think like as I've gotten older I've got I've grown a, a greater appreciation for watching other sports like golf and tennis as well particularly tennis where their sport is so much of that roller coaster like every single serve like the way they're able to mentally just go from one like they they duff a hit and just like hit it into the net or like have a really bad play I remember for us, like when I had a really bad race, I'd get really down about it and I'd be down about it for like days or whatever. And, and I've, I've grown to appreciate like that tennis mentality of like, you have to move on to the next point, like immediately, like don't get overexcited about the one point you just hit because you got another point coming and you have to, you can't, you can't have the extremes of the highs and the lows. You got to really mentally balance that out and, and refocus. And, and I've tried to use that and, and talking about running as well of like you're gonna have bad races it's just gonna happen but you gotta be able to move on and yeah I've so many so much has been said about like comparing running to life um and I've tried to I've recognized that and I've tried to kind of live that in my own life as well it's super way easier said than done but uh there are a lot of really cool parallels about about running in life <clears throat> Yeah, and I would totally agree with you. And, and you're right on it. It's not saying, we're not saying that it's easy to do. But but you are saying like, hey, if you think of it that way and you try to approach it that way, you're probably going to have better luck than those extreme highs and lows, you know. And, uh, you know, real quick, I, I ran a race in Europe and there was a Kenyan and he was, you know, he was supposed to win. He was a pretty good guy, pretty good athlete, supposed to win. And I, I beat him. And he was behind me. And his other Kenyan teammate was, I think, actually won or was second or third. I don't remember, but he was up up front. And we were in that little zone after the race where you get your shoes and stuff on and before the media. And the one Kenyan who beat him says, how'd you do today? And he chimed back. He says, oh, I did awful. You know, it's a horrible race. He's like, but I'll win next week. <laughs> and I was like mind blown you know the mentality because Americans we have this problem where if we have a bad race the season's over we're, got, we're calling our agent or our coach and we're saying send me home <laughs> you know okay. I'm done you know I'm spent there, there mustn't uh, the training didn't work right you know we start blaming everything and totally. the Kenyan guy wasn't he didn't blame anyone he just said I had a bad day I'll win next week and you know what? I was in the race with both of those guys the next week, and that guy did win. You know, and it was like that mentality of just move on. Just let it go. Yeah. Move on. It is, it's not personal. You just had an off day. Everyone totally. has them. We're human beings, you know, so. Totally. <laughs> um, it's hard to do that. That's the, the whole mental thing. I mean, they say men, running is so much mental, and it's not just, it's not just being tough in a workout. It's not just – you know, being tough in one race, it's, it, it runs, it's a vein through all of running. Yeah, it's, it's tough overall. <laughs> it's totally. mentally strong overall. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. Um, so we'll keep it moving. Do you have a specific pre-race food? Um, and we'll keep this one short if you want. But you have a, is there something specific you eat to fuel your body or you always knew fueled you right or, or what? Yeah, this is certainly a case of do 
don't don't do as I did. Uh, if there's one part of my training or whatever running that was really awful, it would have been my nutrition. I I joked that one of my stress fractures back in college was because I was on a steady diet of pop tarts and like I think I had no calcium in my bones. I think they were made out of like pastry, um, <laughs> sugar. Yeah. I had terrible diets. Uh, I used to eat a pint of Ben and Jerry's every night before a race, just because it became like a ritual. Uh, I, I was blessed with a good metabolism. I, I don't know, man. My body could just turn trash into energy, and so I just kept filling it with trash. Although I will say, over having traveled and seen what other athletes eat, I don't think I was alone or the worst. Um, there's certainly been worse that I've seen, and been like, "Geez, how do you even like?" operate but but yeah I, I think there's certainly something to be said there's a lot of people that have done much better work on fine-tuning nutrition and fueling their body properly um i'm i'm not the best resource for that so i think but i think you are actually proving a you're proving something though you're proving that at, although yeah you should have great nutrition it probably also doesn't hurt to have a, some ben and jerry's the night before a race you know what i mean as long as you know, maybe you would have performed better, you know, if you also had the, the better, the good nutritionist, nutrition meal, or whatever, also, but hey, treat yourself from time to time. I mean, you're a human being, it's not going to kill you, you do have a great metabolism, you're running all the time, you know, have that, you know, from time to time, have that, I, my, my athletes, like, after hard workouts, I'm like, go to Falcon's Nest and get a milkshake, you know, a chocolate milkshake, that's great reward yourself and plus there's there's good stuff in there that you for recovery you know so you got to have some balance i think if you're if we don't want to get to that point where it's like this all the time or you might have problems so um so yeah, i think I you mean, did at least prove that and just going back to the point of mental the mentality of it all like there's there's such thing as mental exhaustion if you go from the stress and strain mentally of, of hard training and doing things right and then you have to transfer all that mental stress and strain into like i have to eat this and this and this like it can be done but it's tiring it's tiring stressing about everything all the time so sometimes sometimes it's okay just not stress about it just eat just eat something yeah. yeah yeah for sure um okay so this is probably one of the most fun questions uh we're gonna we're gonna have some fun with this today <laughs> All right, you and I, we go out to a track, all right, and we race the mile. Who's going to win? You or, you, or, you or I? What's your uh, strategy? Yeah, there's no, no question and no strategy, dude. Have you, have you run in the past three years? <laughs> Probably not so much. <laughs> yeah, well, I have not. Uh, if I push my son in his stroller, like, a hundred yards down the street at anything faster than a walk I'm winded. <laughs> <laughs> so it could be a very interesting race is what you're saying. <laughs> it'd be, it'd be, yeah. Uh, no, it'd be a tortoise in the hair, except I'd just stay a tortoise. There'd be no <laughs> so, uh, so we would probably both be trying to sit on each other. Uh, it'd be like one of those 1500 meter championship finals where at, no one wants to take the lead and it's literally <laughs> pedestrian pace. Like they're, they're walking around the track, just waiting for that 150 meter all out kick to see <laughs> who's got it. It would, it'd probably turn into like one of those cycling track races where they stop and balance. I'd probably need a stop break in there at some point too and just rest for a minute. And then we Good, go. cause so would I. <laughs> <laughs> I don't uh, think I could run a mile. Uh, man, I may be able to jog a mile. It would hurt. That'd take well, me at goal, least eight or nine minutes, and it would be painful. My goal is to start running again, so uh, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know. It takes me two years to paint a baseboard. I'm taking on running, like, I don't know where it would fit in. I don't know. <laughs> Something. <laughs> All right, man. Well, hey. We really appreciate you doing this. You did a great job. Uh, great advice. Um, I think uh, young athletes are going to get a lot out of this. So really appreciate it. You've been a great inspiration. Uh, you inspired me. Like I said, you, you gave me great advice throughout my career that I've, I still use to this day. 
um, and I use it and I pass it along. And that's what this sport's all about, you know, and that's why we're doing this. So I really want to say thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, man, it just, it's been great, great catching up. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for putting it together, Rob. We, uh, we should do this more often. Yeah, we really should, man. I, I appreciate it. Hey, enjoy your day. I'll, I'll talk to you later. All right, take care. All right, bye.